Everyone, good morning. Today is our Sunday service. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa. Our Sangha, as everybody is aware, has been giving a series of Dharma talks with the backdrop of living in difficult times. The collective goal of these teachings is to convey how the Buddha understood the workings of our mind, the process of mind, or the nature of mind. And the hope is that thereby you guide the mind to attitudes or states that are liberated and inclining towards peace and freedom. The talk that I'm going to give today is along those lines of filling our meditation toolbox with methods that help us to gain that state of, of peace and freedom. The materials that I present have been collected from two primary sources. One is a master who has passed away long ago by the name of Ajahn Lee. He was a Thai monk in the forest tradition, so spent most of his time meditating, secluded. And I became acquainted with Ajahn Lee through Thanissaro Bhikkhu, also called Ajahn Jeff, who has spoken to Maba on different Dharma talks at least three on three occasions. So the connection between those two is that Ajahn Jeff's teacher was Ajahn Mun, M-U-N, and his teacher was Ajahn Lee. So my talk today will draw on the meditation methods that were taught to Ajahn Mun by Ajahn Lee, and therefore to Ajahn Jeff through Ajahn Mun, if that makes any sense. So there's a direct lineage of teaching that goes back decades. Ajahn Lee wrote a book called Keeping the Breath in Mind. That was translated by Ajahn Jeff, Thanissaro Bhikkhu. In that book, and oh, by the way, that's available. I believe the site is Access to Insight. It's a free PDF. And there's also an autobiography of Ajahn Lee that was also translated by Thanissaro Bhikkhu. But in his book, Keeping the Breath in Mind, Ajahn Lee lays out his methods for what he calls centering the mind. His first, he has two methods of meditation. His first deals almost exclusively with the mind. The second method shows us how to use the body to benefit the mind. Today, I'm going to try and focus almost exclusively on the first method because I find it fascinating. The method was developed from his own practical experience and teaching from his, from his teachers as well, but he had long years of meditation practice practically his entire adult life. He determined that the only path to centering the mind is to learn the breath. Ajahn Lee suggests that if you earnestly set your mind on getting in touch with your breath and following it as far as it can take you, from there you'll enter this stage of liberating insight, which leads to the mind itself. 
and ultimately pure knowing or Buddha as he calls it. And it will stand out on its own. In the text, he uses the heart and the mind practically interchangeable. And he indicates that if our hearts have no inner principle, no center in which to dwell, we are like a person without a home. Homeless people have nothing but hardship. The sun, the wind, rain, and dirt are bound to leave them constantly soiled because they have nothing to act as a shelter. When we practice centering the mind, we are building a home for the mind, for ourselves. Once you have a home, you have a safe place to keep your valuables. He goes on to say that whoever trains the mind to be centered gains a refuge. A centered mind is like a fortress. Discernment is like a weapon. To practice centering the mind is to secure yourself in a fortress. And so is something very worthwhile and important. I, John Jeff and his materials, apart from the book, takes this fortress metaphor and he says, you have to focus inside. You have to focus inside and, the, and he takes this fortress to show that the different parts of the practice correspond to different parts of the, of the fortress. And this is a concept that was developed by the Buddha. So beginning with conviction, this is the conviction that you have in your heart, in your mind, in the Buddha's awakening. The conviction is just that that we suffer because of our own actions. But we can also put an end to the suffering based on our own actions. It's entirely up to us. It all depends on you. If you're fir firmly convinced, if you have that conviction, it helps to erase a lot of the fear that swirls in the world around us. So long as you maintain your own purity of thought and word and deed, you will be safe. People can do physical harm to you, but that's not nearly as severe. And A. John Jeff says that the physical harm will end with this lifetime. But if you do yourself mental harm, through your acts, your deeds, that will last beyond this lifetime. So as we look at the concept of a fortress, I, I, when, when the, the Buddha talks about a fortress, I see a, a huge castle up on a hill in Germany. The different parts of the fortress are there to protect the people inside. In our case, the fortress protects you basically from yourself. In the Buddha's time, when they were constructing a building, and in our case, a fortress, the underlying principle for the structure was the foundation post. The fortress would be built initially by placing a foundation post around which everything else would unfold. So you'd want a foundation post that's solid and secure. The entire rest of the fortress, the entire structure will depend on that foundation post. Around the fortress is an encircling moat and a road. These stand for the sense of shame and sense of compunction. Ajahn Jeff goes on to say that shame here is the opposite of shamelessness, where you don't care about what other pe people think of what you're going to do and you just do what you want. 
in this circumstance, it's important that you care about the right people when it comes to your thoughts and your actions. Here, you must care about what the awakened ones would think about your actions. What would the Buddha say? Ask yourself what it looks like, this action, this thought, in the eyes of the Buddha or in other noble ones. When you think about doing or saying or acting upon something, pause and ask yourself, is this skillful? What would the noble ones think of this action, this thought? These noble folks, these awakened people, they have compassion for everyone. And they're concerned about your actions and thought and how it's going to affect you. Reflecting on this would make it less likely that you're going to do something harmful to others and therefore to yourself. And this provides protection for you. A. John Jeff says, this goes with compul compunction. Compunction is the realization that certain actions lead to suffering. And you would just rather not do them due to their long-term effect, their long-term harm. Compunction in this situation is the opposite of empathy on the one hand and callousness on the other. In other words, it's your sense of conscience. This was what protects you. We come to discernment. And the discernment is likened to the high wall of the fortress, which is covered in slick plaster. The plaster acts as a surface to repel any of the enemies that try to scale the outside of the fortress. So you want the discernment that looks at other people's actions and make sure that they don't touch you. You have to be concerned about your own actions so that you can clearly see what actions are coming in from the outside and which ones are skillful and have an ability to avoid those that are unskillful and not become influenced by the unskillful. When we get inside of our fortress, there are soldiers. These soldiers are likened to right effort. When you see something arising in the mind that's unskillful, you know how to abandon it. And even a further skill is developed when you can see it arising. When you see the Vedna, the feeling tone arising, and you know it's unskillful, and you figure out ways to prevent that arising. Ajahn Jeff goes on to say that. We often think that meditation is just about being in the present moment. And that's the popular definition. Being in the present moment and not trying to anticipate things. But you do, according to Edge on Jeff, you do have to anticipate how greed, anger, delusion, aversion might come into your mind. Have a plan what you do ahead of time to prevent those things from happening. And when they do arise, if they do arise, how you let go of them. It's good to have a large fund of Dharma knowledge. Our minds are bombarded with so many bizarre messages. There's so much social media, YouTube videos on how to do this what this stands for, messages from the media. There are some people that go through their entire life basing their knowledge on things they heard on TV or on the internet. Who knows where that information comes from? And there's certainly no guarantee it's reliable. So if you fill your mind with good knowledge, useful knowledge, knowledge that helps you understand your mind, you're building a strong fortress. A. John Jeff goes on to say that the fortress has a gatekeeper. What is the gatekeeper? It's your mindfulness. 
The duty of the gatekeeper or your mindfulness is to recognize who's coming in, which people are friends and which people are foes. Block out the foes, but allow the friends in. This stands for the function of mindfulness as well. Remember what is an unskillful mind state and how many unskillful mind states have you encountered? Know the difference between skillful and unskillful mind states. Be able to recognize them when they come. When the skillful mind states manifest, encourage it. And when the bad mind states or the unskillful ones come, sweep them out with one fail swoop. Therefore, in meditation, we are not just allowing things to arise and pass away. We use insight to determine which things are skillful and which are unskillful. The way that the Buddha taught meditation, he established an agenda because we are trying to develop skillful qualities in the mind. We're going to have to learn how to depend on skillful qualities and not let the unskillful qualities take root and grow. A. John Jeff says that mindfulness allows us to remember what lessons we can learn from the past. It's a function of your active memory applied to the present moment together with alertness, ardency, which is basically right effort. In other words, if the gatekeeper sees something coming that's big and dangerous, he calls on the soldiers of right effort to defend the fortress, to defend the mind. So mindfulness, concentration, practice, and right effort work together. The mind must have support for all this work because it's very taxing. A. John Jeff says that this is where the fortress has stores of food and water. So during meditation, we get the mind to settle down. Picture a, a muddy glass of water. If you set the glass down, the mud will basically eventually fall to the bottom. This centering or settling down of the mind, this is food for the mind. In this state, you begin to recognize those skillful states that we want to encourage and foster. It allows the mind, this calming, to settle down with a sense of pleasure and refreshment. And as the mind settles, as the mud falls away, the mind gets really solid. Then the pleasure and rapture will fall away. And what's left is a sense of equanimity. When the mind is dependent on nothing more than being able to breathe comfortably, it can find pleasure and nourishment with the breath. Then you're going to be less likely to be shaken by changes in the outside world. I'll give you an example personally from, from my perspective on Monday. I had to have a surgical procedure. And I'm a person that I go for other people's operations, but I've never had one myself besides a colonoscopy. So I treated it as a new experience, but I never lost my mindfulness. You go into this sterile environment, and maybe it's because of the nerves, but it, see, it seems so cold. And I, I suppose they keep the cold temperatures to stunt the bacteria growth. But the first thing they do is take you in, give you the, here, put these clothes on. Take all your clothes off. Put these clothes on, which are not the most modest of clothes. Sit you in a big chair with a TV blaring right in front of me. And the first thing I asked the nurse was, can you turn that TV off? And then I set about calming my mind, 
letting the mud fall out, instilling my mind, centering my mind. Because I didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, the doctor had told me what he was going to do and how he was going to do it and that I would be knocked out. But your mind tends to run. It loves drama. It loves to jump on those thought trains and take you to places where you don't really want to go. So I calmed as my calm my mind, calm my mind until the procedure, until it was time to, to do the procedure. And I, I was really quite shocked when they took my blood pressure. I expected that I would be, I felt calm. I felt centered. And my blood pressure was 117 over 72, which I thought under the circumstances showed that the mindfulness was working. And I'm not, I'm not telling you this to, to, to brag or to boast. I'm just telling you that this practice, focusing on the breath, doing your meditation, having an intention for each meditation, it truly works. You can take charge of your mind. You can take charge of your body. When we work on concentration during meditation, it's not only for right now. It's to nourish skillful qualities of the mind and give strength to your skillful qualities. So this fortress of the mind is well protected and can withstand whatever the world throws at you, whatever the outside offers you, greed, anger, delusion, and you won't be shaken by them. If you are shaken, you know how to recover. And I can guarantee you with sustained practice, you will not be shaken like the average person because their mind is untrained. Their mind runs like a wild elephant, a wild horse. We develop this fortress mentality all the while realizing it's not the dangers from others that we have to watch out for. It's our own mind. For example, let's say someone insults you. Um, I guess the classic example is being cut off in traffic. Don't let your mind run to a place where you have to think, I'm going to get him back. I'm going to chase this guy down. Or I'll think of a better insult and I'll get him. Let their karma be their karma. Don't fall into the trap of reacting. This is, this is where we see the Vedna, the feeling tone, the feeling, and we catch it before it arises and gives, and gives a bad outcome. You are responsible for the state of your own mind. When you realize where the true dangers are in developing this fortress mentality, then you can be heedful. Then you use your heedfulness to develop qualities that keep you safe. And John Jeff says that all these qualities work together synergistically to take you beyond merely being able to withstand bad influences from outside or bad influences from within. It can take you to an attainment that's totally secure. It's not subject to the vagaries of space or time at all. That's not in the image of the fortress, but it's where all the elements of the fortress can lead. And you don't want to do anything to get into the way of that ultimate destination. Ajahn Lee says that the first part of the path is virtue and discernment. These are more easy to practice. 
but it's especially difficult in keeping the mind centered, which is the middle part of the path, and takes some effort because it's a matter of forcing the mind into shape. It's taking that wild horse and taming it so that it's useful. Centering the mind is like placing bridge pillars in the middle of a river. It's very difficult to do. But once the mind is firmly in place, it can be very useful in developing virtue and discernment. Virtue is like placing the pilings for a bridge on the near shore. Discernment is like placing them on the far shore. But the middle pilings, if they are not firmly in place, that's where all the pressure comes from. If they're not firmly in place, you'll never be able to bridge the flood of suffering. Develop the mind to be centered and still. Then discernment can arise. Discernment here doesn't refer to ordinary discernment. It refers to the insights that come solely from dealing directly with the mind. He points out that the Buddha studied with many masters for many years. And it was not until the Buddha took hold of his own destiny, turned his intention to his own heart and mind, and went off to practice on his own that he gained liberation. Keeping track of his breath was the first step that the Buddha took. If it's good enough for the Buddha, you think it might be good enough for us? We focus our attention on the breath, something all of us have, at zero cost. We focus on the breath to the point where the mind settles down and becomes centered. And this gives you the chance to re really meet pure knowing. Now, the method that Ajahn Lee used and that has been adopted by Ajahn Jeff is what they simply call meditation method one. Personally, I think of this as advanced breath work. And perhaps that's why it's so fascinating to me, because Ajahn Lee was known historically for a lot of feats that you might think of as metaphysical, almost. There are not a lot of these. There's none of that in his autobiography, because it's, it's not prudent to talk about your attainments. And that's why I told you when I, when I was able to control my mind before my surgery, I'm not telling you that to boast. I'm not, I'm telling you out of complete humility because I'm not a meditation master. I've only been meditating for 12 years. So if I can control my mind under those circumstances, I want you to know that you can do the same thing. And many of you are so far advanced in your meditation, you far, far exceed what I do on a daily basis. So the practical instructions, these are what I'm going to give you in the next 10 minutes. And as I said, the meditation methods are available on the Internet. And although they sound complex, they're not that complex. And I think that the true measure is ardency, is mindfulness and practicing. Practice, practice, practice. What is the old saying? Practice makes perfect. Well, probably none of us are going to become perfect but we can become better and better. 
the brain has been shown to be just like a muscle. And years ago, when I was in undergraduate studies, there was a principle called the said principle. Specific adaptation to implied demand. That was with respect to muscles. If you lift heavy weights, you're going to get big muscles. The concept with the brain, which is the corollary to the said principle, is called neuroplasticity. The brain is not unlike a muscle. Remember what the Buddha said, what the mind thinks the mind becomes. So you can use that plasticity, that ability to mold your mind as Ajahn Lee says, get it into shape. Put a bridle on that horse. Teach him who's boss. Now, Ajahn Lee first instructs us to begin the meditation by paying homage to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Then he tells us to think of the in and the out breath, counting the breath in pairs as one. As you do this, you start out saying bud, B-U-D, with the in-breath, and do, D-H-O, with the out-breath. So bud, do. This should be done 10 times. After that's completed, those 10 cycles of breath, breath then shift to thanking budo with the in-breath and budo with the out-breath for seven pairs of breath. Then repeat this for five cycles of breath only thinking Budo once each cycle or pair of breaths. Ajahn Lee then instructs us to let the breath be relaxed and natural. Keep the mind perfectly still, focused on the breath as it comes in and out of the nostrils. When the breath goes out, don't send the mind out after the breath. When it comes in, don't let the mind follow it in. Focus on the tip of the nose, the area around the nostrils. Let the awareness be wide and open. Don't force. Don't force the mind. Relax. Pretend that you're breathing out into wide open space. Keep the mind still like a post. Remember our ledger post? Keep the mind still like a post at the edge of the sea. When the ocean rises, the post stays. It doesn't rise with the water. When the water ebbs, the post doesn't stink, sink. It stays there. When you've reached this level of stillness, now you can stop thinking Buddha. Simply be aware of the feeling of the breath. Constantly be aware of the breath. The next step is to bring your attention inward, focusing on the various aspects of the breath, the important aspects that give rise to intuitive powers of various kinds. He instructs us to pay attention to the various elements or potentials that are connected with and can be of use to the body. These elements come from the bases of the breath. When I say bases, it's B-A-S-E-S. Think of this as what you would call a home base. It's the physical location to locate the breath on the body. For example, the first base, center the mind on the tip of the nose and then so slowly move into the middle of the forehead. So your breathing focuses on the tip of the nose, then goes to the middle of the forehead. The second base is this forehead. Then you want to bring it back to the nose. And you want to keep moving between the nose and the forehead, nose, forehead, like climbing a mountain and do this seven times. Or maybe you could think of it as climbing up the rungs of a ladder and then back down. Then let the breath settle at the forehead and don't let it go back to the nose. Then we come to the third base. Let the breath move 
to the middle of the top of the head and let it settle there for a moment. Let you keeping your awareness bright. Inhale the breath at that base, the middle of the top of the head, and let it spread out throughout the head for a moment. Then move it back, move the mind and the breath back and forth between the forehead and the top of the head seven times, finally letting it rest on the top of the head. Now we come to the fourth breath, fourth base, our fourth home base. This is the middle of the brain. Let it be still for a moment. In other words, we're bringing the breath. We're going to be breathing as if the breath is coming through the top of the head and going into the middle of the brain. Then we're gonna breathe there for a moment, bring the breath back to the top of the head and go back and forth between these stuff, these two spots. Finally, finally, let it settle in the middle of the brain, keeping your awareness bright and let the, this refined breath in the brain spread to the lower parts of the body. It is at this point that you may find the breath start to give rise to various signs. These are called nimittas, N-I-M-I-T-T-A. This can be seeing or feeling hot, cold, or tingling sensations in the head. You may see a pale mercury vapor or your own skull. Don't let yourself be affected by whatever appears in the mind. These are mind created, these nimittas. If you see that a namita appears, mindfully focus your awareness on it. So we're shifting away from the breath momentarily. We're shifting to this bright namita. Be sure to select only one namita at a time and choose the one that's the most comfortable or the most appealing to you. Once you've gotten a hold of that namita, expand it so that it's as large as your head. The bright white namita is very useful to the body and mind. It's a pure breath that can cleanse the blood in the body, reduce or eliminate feelings of pain. Stay with that namita. And then we move to the fifth base. You have this white namita, this white light, brilliant light, as large as the head. Now take it down to the fifth base, our fifth home base. And that's the center of the chest. Once it's firmly settled there, let it spread out to fill the chest. Make this breath as white and bright as possible. And then let both the breath and the light spread out to the entire body, to every pore, until different parts of the body appear on their own as pictures. And if you don't want the pictures, just take a few long breaths and they'll disappear. Always keeping your awareness still and expansive. At this point, we don't let the awareness latch onto anything or be affected by any namita that may appear to pass into the brightness of the breath. Just keep careful watch over the mind. Keep it as one. When you reach this point, knowledge will gradually begin to unfold. The body will be light like fluff, rested and refreshed subtle, solitary, self-contained. There will be an extreme sense of physical pleasure and mental ease. If you want to acquire knowledge and skill, practice these steps until you master being able to give rise to the namita of the breath, the white light, the brilliantly white ball, whenever you want. If you want knowledge, simply make the mind still and go to getting rid of all your preoccupations, everything the mind is mumbling on, is, is, is discursive with this papancha in the mind, leaving just the brightness. Then think one or two times whatever you want to know, all things inside or outside concerning yourself or others, and the knowledge will arise or a picture will appear. To become thoroughly expert, you should, if possible, study directly with someone who has practiced this and is skillful in this matter. Because knowledge of this sort can only come from the practice of centering the mind. 